And thanks to all of our panelists for uh, giving us a, such a varied perspective. So we would like to open it now to all of you. Uh, okay, you raised your hand first. you have is because you guys have are closer to the data you guys have access to the data which which that which the uh, data analytics can be run upon and where the algorithms can be put in place to bring the meaningful or actionable insights so my question is as you are building the empire to hire people and to and to go in this space People in this room are also some entrepreneurs out here, or they want to also participate in this in this whole wave of Internet of Things. Will can there be an opportunity where where the data, as it is, proprietary or residential within within the enterprises, can be exposed? The privacy can be can be removed. I mean, the privacy information can be removed, but it can be exposed, and small entrepreneurs can get that data and can run and can do more innovative algorithms on it and we all can be part of the same same internet of things wave and can build more innovative solutions can there be a possibility like that i i, I can take this so we absolutely the answer is yes if you look at a smart city uh, architecture a smart city combines transportation healthcare education all those all those data are coming what you will see is that there will be a new uh, a broker or exchange information exchange or broker that will that will be responsible for the privacy and the policy and what information goes to what I'll give you an example in the healthcare you have so many stakeholders you have your insurance uh, company you have your pharmacy you have your general practitioner you have even uh, your um, your own own uh, private uh, uh, thing, so y your own uh, social circle. So the who gets what information uh, is got to be very careful. Same thing for the uh, traffic. I mean, if you look at transportation, there is auto OEMs who wants to do about uh, diagnostics. There are people about traffic management. There is about uh, the uh, good driver behavior, like progressives of the world. So they all need canned information and they will be building on that but what it requires is as you collect all this information I believe that there will be a, a, a different um, players that have to come and play this mediator or broker service and they will be held accountable for privacies uh, and they will have to figure out what information is um, shared and not shared and how it is shared. So just to add, um, we have two customers, uh, one's in the Bay Area called um, uh, Blue Kai, another one in Exalate in New York. And in the advertising and behavioral space, they are exchanges exactly like what we're talking about. So these are data management platforms in advertising parlance. And as an entrepreneur, you can hook up with these guys. And you can say, uh, I want to open an account with you. And I'm, when I see this particular cookie, I want to know the audience information about it right now. I want to know some uh, uh, randomized and aggregate information about their last behavior, et cetera. Um, so we're already seeing this in the internet of people where there are these brokers. They're not household names is the interesting thing, right? You do have to, you know, I don't know if, if there is one yet for parking, right? But mm -hmm. uh, they're going to happen. These information exchanges, they already exist in advertising and behavior. Uh, I believe that they're going to happen with Internet of Things as well. They have to. So I, can, I can just add another dimension to it, not to just keep going with that same question. But uh, So for a company like GE, um, we certainly are looking at a whole partner ecosystem. Uh, there is no way on earth that we can build the entire end-to-end -end industrial internet alone all by ourselves. Uh, for example, um, our sets of, you know, customers, vendors, suppliers, um, you know, um, the companies that basically do, let's say, maintenance on our behalf and everybody else who is some sort of service provider would certainly be part of the story. So that that is definitely there. Um, I think the other part is, uh, I think you mentioned more in terms of individuals. I think that was probably your question in terms of can individuals actually use that data and do something with it. Uh, I don't know if we will do anything like that, uh, considering that we are a very business to business type of an organization. So I don't know if it's really relevant for us there. Uh, there potentially may be cases where it gets relevant, especially with the you know 
things where we get closer to the consumer space but i don't even know about that i don't believe that's anywhere happening immediately uh, what we are doing though apart from that is that at least in the bay area so uh, the other reason just to mention why did g even set up the center in bay area and why that is relevant is because uh, there is an important ecosystem here where people are learning from each other so you know just for example big data i mean if you look at the number of big data companies and the various offshoots of you know the original things that kind of you know emerged from those google papers and things done at yahoo with hadoop you know how things have gone so far and there are so many different companies you know that have emerged out of that small little humble beginnings is that because people are all around here and kind of learning from each other and employees are kind of moving companies also are taking that knowledge along with them so uh, that is definitely going to happen we certainly want to participate in that uh, some of you may have heard of some of the investment decisions that ge made recently for example we uh, took a stake in pivotal so you know which is uh, a player like aerospike so to speak mm -hmm. uh, you know also solving the big data problem in their own way and i believe that more of that will happen i mean i don't know for sure but yeah uh, that kind of participation would continue to happen and that i think would not only happen with say a company like g but i'm pretty sure that every other player in the segment would look at either partnering or investing or doing something or the other in the space so it's likely to happen yeah that's a short answer thank you mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my name is Miguel Cobo. I'm working for Ericsson, uh, the Swedish multinational. Uh, I would say, as an analogy to what you said, 50% of the calls in nor North America, mobile calls, come through our systems. So we're coming from the telecom uh, world. Um, more reflection. Um, three years ago, we, we initiated a, a study on Internet of Things. We wanted to uh, really understand uh, an outside, uh, outside in view of, uh, of this phenomena. Uh, I read the report from Cisco, more than 11 exabytes of uh, uh, data uh, on the mobile, uh, um, that will be generated for mobile data traffic per month, which uh, for those who don't know it's an exabyte is 18 zeros, so it's a lot of, uh, <laughs> of data. And I, uh, we realized that uh, the industry is taking for granted a lot of things, uh, and there are some basic pr uh, prerequisites that needs to be fixed before we see the explosion of revenues. First, how we're going to fix the revenue sharing between those who own the networks and that need to pay for the infrastructure for that data to go across. That is an important factor. The other one is the price of the sensors, because uh, things could be anything, right? A car is easy to manage. But I've seen, uh, I've se we have seen companies that even put some uh, sensor in a pill that you digest right here. So. The price of those sensors needs to be cents or a cent to really make that. And then we realize also that sooner or later we will need to have identity management of things. We'll have to create a Wikipedia of things. We need to create some kind of LinkedIn of things, <laughs> right? Because, <laughs> of course, where will be the values on the connectivity of non-obvious or not trivial thing, right? And as I say, I was more uh, wanted to know what was your opinion about, at least that was our findings, and we, we noticed that it will take some time before we can see this huge amount of money that in some reports are reflected. But these are important factors. And finally, also the, the authentication, right? Not only that we need to authenticate that those things says the right thing, right, uh, as information, but also those things should be able to authenticate systems that are asking them information because of fraud and everything. Anyway, just a reflection. Mm. Any comments on the? <laughs> I mean, I, I can I can definitely take a shot at it. I think first of all, I think I alluded that um, we have silos today in the vertical, and in the future, which could be somewhere around 2020, where I call a connected society, which is society which is connecting things and people. And, ob and objects and so on. So that is that is what you're talking about, where everything comes to. So I think that is that timing is more. Uh, it might be somewhere after 2018, 2020. That's when it will be, because right now the industry is busy in in vertical, co vertically connecting their own and solving their own problem, and then the mm -hmm. next opportunity is going to be when you do mashup of these different things. They are not supposed to talk to each other. The network analytics 
is not supposed to talk to date device analytics. That's not supposed mm -hmm. to talk to user data analytics. Mm -hmm. Now, when you mesh this three-dimensional stuff together, you create a new type of application that we have not thought about. Today, mm -hmm. most of those things are linear on the same level. We have, we can do network analytics, great. Someone, uh, you know, Google can do great uh, user data analytics and so on, what's happening. When you start mashing all those things, new opportunities uh, comes around. Talking about security. It's a, it's a very important that mutual authentication, identity identity management. I don't know whether, uh, I know you're with Ericsson, I don't know whether the SIM is the answer <laughs> to many of those. Uh, an interesting debate. Yes. Definitely yeah, well, then you have the operators uh, really getting scared whether they lose control of the subscriber or not. So there are some, there are some emotional aspects and, and financial aspects of soft SIM and the impact on roaming and so on. So, so uh, but definitely it's going towards eSIM and, uh, and that direction. But the, the authentication, the security angle is, is very important. Identity management uh, is, is going to be a very key. And this is device identity management. Um, so those are, that's why I alluded that we have a specific group now looking into security, which is not IT security. And that's what we're calling an internet security, which means intelligent, unintelligent objects. Sometimes you don't have IP address. I know we are calling internet of things, but RFID has IP address? Really? No, right? So RFID reader has. So, but how, the, how do you authenticate? How does a sensor in an oil pipe where you want to know that if the pipe temperature has gone more than 50 degrees, how do you make sure that a rogue sensor mm -hmm. is not giving a wrong information and you're making those uh, um, unintelligent decisions? So mm -hmm. uh, those are, I think the security is, is going to be, I think people who work on security, by the way, good news. I think uh, the industry is, has always loved you guys. You always have been on top, but this is another huge <laughs> opportunity, which is uh, uh, security for Internet of Things. And um, that's a huge opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. So just to add to that small bit, I mean, I, uh, this is not a company viewpoint or anything, but it's just my personal viewpoint. I think that uh, you have to realize that um, I think a lot of this would happen for sure because there is a lot of opportunity, as you know, a friend from QuickPay was saying. So the opportunity itself might drive some innovation, as always happens. Um, but I think beyond that, if you just historically go back and look at it, and this is actually read somewhere, so I'm kind of stealing off a book that I read, uh, the idea that most big innovations or big things happen when three things align. And I think if I remember that correctly, <laughs> is good economy, uh, fair competition, and uh, critical mass. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what has led all along, uh, for if then three things kind of align, then most big turning points happen. That's when you know the space wars happened. That's when internet boomed. Many of these happened on times when somehow you know the all three have to match. So now, if you look at it right now and you're trying to map good economy, I think hopefully we'll see good economy in future. <laughs> we've probably seen the bottom out, so uh, I'm not hoping we keep going bottoming out further. Mm -hmm. uh, competition, I think, yeah, there's a fair bit of competition coming up with all these investments and people wanting to gain something out of those and also all the other innovation that's going on. So that will generate some competition among big, small, and all kinds of players. And then the third one is critical mass, which time will tell how soon the critical mass will happen. I think the only thing that we have learned over the years is that the amount of time it takes to generate critical mass is just rapidly decreasing. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you start looking at, again, innovation cycles, it took X number of years from, you know, say, uh, uh, aviation technology or automobile technology, whatever to evolve. And then now if you start looking at current technological trends, including all the stuff that's happened in the world of mobile uh, and smartphones especially, that's a great indication, right? It's now reduced down to even less than three months, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, Samsung comes out with four models every year, I think, these days, <laughs> not even once in a year. So, mm -hmm. so just, just my two cents to that. I'd like to add one more point over there, specifically on the uh, on the big dollars being quoted out there. I think uh, given given the traditional approach of quoting big market revenue generation, I did that. I said twenty six billion dollars. But what we are seeing today is a lot of it is cross pollination of data going from one segment to another. For instance, I mean, I think there was a gentleman who was asking about uh, can we collect data? Can we innovate? SFMTA, if you go over there, a lot of the information is actually freely available. So cities are making that movement, right? Uh, that allows you to build a solution 
for advertisement, for instance, which will tell you in this particular location how many newcomers come in. You can build an application over there and go and go sell, go fight Groupon and the space that they could not innovate, right? So I think, I think those kind of cross-pollination will happen. So you will see the dollars kind of spray over. There won't be the classical devices and the systems and the switches that were being sold, but cross-pollination of information going from one segment to another. I mean, there are solutions out there that as you're driving, your information is being pumped in through the networks. I just want to yes. phrase, because I, I think maybe you didn't get my point. Mm -hmm. My point is that the, the success that you, that you have on the company is because you own the, those sensors, right? Mm -hmm. You don't depend on second source. Your information and your business of the accuracy of your sensors, correct? That's not true. The, uh, some of the information that we collect yes. are sensors which are installed by the city, Fine. built by somebody else. Fine. But if those sensors send wrong information, yes. your business, you're out of business. Correct. That's what I'm trying to say. Correct. So without creating an infrastructure of validating the source, validating that the, sir, the, the sensor mm -hmm. are truly sending the right information, so you need to do much more than just collect the data. You need to validate that your source says the truth. That's correct. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, again, these exabytes of data, that infrastructure which Cisco or Ericsson will sell, well, if we're not able to connect part of the revenue sharing to those who are transporting that information, even though it's boring, as you said, yep, yep. there will not be any Internet of Things. That's all what I'm trying to say as mm -hmm. a reflection. Mm -hmm. So just to share one um, vignette from the advertising space, uh, and again, I'm sure the advertising space doesn't, you know, if you get one sensor glitch, yeah, no babies die. Uh, I like that kind of space. Um, but <laughs> there are techniques that do not require cryptography and do not require that kind of analysis. You can do it in other ways, right? So in advertising, what you look for is you look for spurious patterns. Now, how do you tell a black swan from a spurious pattern is an interesting process problem in signal processing. Uh, but you do need to figure out uh, where the robots are, where the scanners are, uh, and where uh, essentially fraud detection is happening within the internet in order to ignore those patterns. Um, so they're just saying there are some other uh, ways besides uh, sort of crypto secure technologies. Remember <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, well taken. Dave Shields, our consultant in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, three points, and I think the last speaker touched on some of them briefly, tangentially. First one relates to intellectual property. In such dense, interconnected, interdependent nodes and networks, who's going to own the inter uh, intellectual property generated? Or implicitly, will every participant give a free license to everyone else? That's one thing. Second thing is, what happens about product liability and warranty and so on in such dense interconnection? Who's going to be liable for what? The third question is, if everybody's in a node or in a network and somebody doesn't like it after a while and they pull out, causing consequential losses to the other parties, will the lawyers have a field day? <laughs> Are you a lawyer, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> well, very interesting question. I don't know if any of our panelists is ready to tackle that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a shot at it because we see some of this in advertising today. Um, the, the chains of sort of liability and control and ownership are actually kind of common sense in a lot of ways. Um, this, the, the only hard part is uh, if you own a sensor, uh, you sort of feel that you have uh, sort of first rights at ownership of the generation of that sensor. Uh, and usually you have some rights to place it um, created by some ULIT like, right? So if you're, uh, I was working in a company called iControl, which has now uh, created the home automation system uh, ADT Pulse. And so ADT, when they install a system, they believe they have some ownership created by the, the installation guide that says, you know, we can do X, Y with your data. Uh, the analysis that gets created is done by whoever's done, doing the analysis, right? So you've got those sensors created, then you've got the IP created by those an analysis folks. Um, part of the business driver of Internet of Things is going to be selling those analysis, right? When QuickPay uh, uh, opens up APIs because now they can not only, uh, uh, they have their own data and they're able to sort of do things with that data, they enable an entrepreneur 
Well, I mean, it's pretty clear. You know, QuickPay maybe did some analysis, or they're selling raw sensor data for less. Someone else creates an analysis for it. Um, you know, we've worked this out within the advertising space, and it's actually not that big a deal. Now, the liability problems, I don't know. That's, that's hard. <laughs> but once you know ownership, maybe you know liability. So um, I would like to say something around, around the reliability. I, I want to avoid the liability, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, so what we are seeing in the industry, and, and that is coming down, is a new consumption model. Um, and, and I want to share with you an a, a example of how the risk mitigation and the reliability is, is passed on from you know, the traditional way where you have the entitlement to the people who are making it. It started in the, in the aviation industry where the concept is power by hour. So you pay for the hour of operation and the, and the vendor is responsible for the uptime. So, and, and that was in a, a very expensive jet engines and so on. Now that has trickled down even to the lighting pole. I'm working with this uh, famous lighting pole company in Netherlands, uh, you, you have to figure out who it is. Uh, they put light poles, uh, very well known, has been around for a long, long time. Uh, uh, typically, I'll give you an example of what's happening with city. A light pole typically costs around 10,000 euro for European Europeans out there for physical labor and whole installation per light pole is 10,000 euros. Now the cities don't have that much money anymore. And you, I don't know if you drive across Europe, you'll see some places uh, the roads are lit up, some places is dark, it's based on the ability of each city, each, each, uh, well, and their affordability. What has happened is now that's been turned around, now the vendor who's, who's building the light and the light poles are responsible for putting it into the ground and it's sold as lighting as a service and cities are paying per, per month, which is much more easier, instead of paying 10,000 euro per light pole, so they can use that money for healthcare, education, and other places. What it also means is the people who are making those equipment are responsible for the uptime, so they're doing even better. By the way, a example, when I was studying at a university in Netherlands, and my professors were from those industries, and the, the fluorescent light was invented, we had to do what is called a quality of service, which means make sure the light don't last too long because we want people to buy, go and buy again. So there was a, there was a, so we were optimizing the product for our revenue because that's the way we had the revenue. Your light has to go down, you have to go buy a new one. When you change the consumption model, which is as a service, uh, now the responsibility turn around. So now we are making much more greener, much reliable, and it's uptime and uh, there is a SLA around it. So I think, I think those, those changes of uh, consumption models are also going to drive the people who builds the infrastructure, builds those things, are gonna be part of the owner, uh, uh, will have the responsibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, is it working? I can just talk louder. Oh. Is it better? No, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can hear me, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Godfrey Chua from uh, Infinitics Research, uh, tech analyst uh, covering machine to machine, IoT, and things like that. Um, I actually have many questions, so I'm just going to pick one uh, and maybe kind of steer the discussion a little bit more into the business model side of things in terms of how we can actually, from an economic standpoint, drive adoption of IoT. Um, Taking the smart city as, as an example, because I think the panelists can all talk to uh, different aspects of it. Is, you know, so we've been looking at the smart cities, uh, various initiatives around the world, talking to some of the constituencies there. And I mean, obviously, it's a very challenging process. A lot of players involved, a lot of bureaucracy to deal with. Ultimately, <coughs> to try and push it forward, you need real economic drivers to get the cities really thinking, we can do this, and we can pay for it, and it's not just going to come out of tax dollars. Um, one of the things that have come out is parking, actually, could be one of the killer applications for it. So I'm just curious from the panelist standpoint, what other examples can you cite, uh, you know, especially uh, Cisco, uh, in terms of business models that are helping drive, uh, you know, you, you provided some examples already, but business models that can drive, for example, the smart city, what applications, services can help justify the investment so it's not just coming out of tax dollars? Yeah. So uh, I'll start and then please chime in. Mm -hmm. So cities have CIOs, 
I think I think you may, I don't know if many people know that even San Jose has a CIO, and he's a very progressive guy, fantastic guy. But uh, so uh, cities are looking. You know, traditional way is um, we did a parking meter in San Mateo and San Francisco, which uh, we paid for it because the city didn't have the money. But uh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, we are incubating uh, Internet of Things, and uh, that's great examples. But um, some of the city CIOs are looking, so you have to find a new way of, of monetizing. Now, you will be surprised that cities get tax dollar by where you live, right? So there is a competition for skilled workers to be in San Jose rather than in some other county. So cities will be competing with each other. That's the new economy we're going to go. Because when you have Internet of Things and when you have this kind of broadband capability, you will have uh, a lot of the example was mentioned here. What was done by human is now automated. So, so you will. So, so the skilled workers. You need to attract the skilled workers. You need to attract the business. One of the way San Jose is looking at San Jose CIO is looking at is to provide that broadband in the city as a, as automatically for the businesses. Hopefully, the businesses will come. The the, the they will attract the skilled workers and that will attract the businesses to come. So the broadband is by default. And they get the revenue through the taxation. Because businesses happen, they get tax dollars. So it's an indirect model of, of really funding a city rather than upfront. OK, who is going to pony up? Let's put it. And uh, so you have to make some bets. And, and, and that's how you would see some of the cities doing it. And as it becomes more successful, uh, others will follow. Quick follow on that. Yeah. Uh, has Cisco done some studies to actually put some numbers behind that, maybe commission it with some professors or something? And, and the reason I'm motivated to ask that question is, it's funny you mentioned CIOs, so I'm actually chairing a panel of CIOs on smart cities in Shanghai in three weeks. Mm -hmm. So if Cisco has some data, <laughs> it would be very interesting. Well, we have good examples of uh, CIOs. I d we don't have, I mean, we are always looking at uh, Chicago CIO and uh, San Jose, some of the ones who are progressive in, 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 in their way to innovate their cities and how to attract talent. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a, there is a uh, and, and then talent attracts also businesses. So uh, yeah, it, it is, and, and then you have to do upfront. And, and there also, don't forget that there is a, also an, another model emerging, which is a public-private partnership. And that is also another, another way where cities can uh, have to figure out, you know, how to have this uh, pub sub or public s and, 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 and private, um, uh, re uh, sorry, public private uh, partnership to do a lot of, lot of the things. In Europe, 33% uh, of the roads are uh, tall roads, and, and that's a public private uh, partnership. So you could see major infrastructure uh, of that magnitude to be following some, some type of model like that. But I'm not aware of this, uh, of, a, of we have done, I, we don't have, I don't think we have a yeah. study of that one, but. Uh, I think it'd be, it's something for an economics professor to look at, you know, retention of workforce and things like that. Yeah, that's a good it one. Be yeah, good one. So just a sort of um, slight diversion to your question, actually. So I think you're absolutely right. There is a lot of impact on the smart city stuff. and. This is, I'm not even talking much as my GE hat on right now because you know there is a smart city initiative that GE will participate in, but I'm not even aware of those details, so I have no rights to speak about it. But uh, I'm just seeing from just general trends that if you take that one step further and look at just agencies, so what I mean by county is you know state governments and so on and so forth, uh, there are actually three or four opportunities that I think are biggest in terms of uh, just monetary value. Uh, one huge area is just energy consumption. So for example, if you look at it, smart meter has created both a lot of excitement and also a lot of uh, opposition because some people also feel that it kind of uh, you know, enters into the whole privacy realm and uh, you, know, you get uh, you know, sort of penalized for certain kinds of behavior, right? But uh, having said that, you know, the whole energy consumption is going to be a massive segment. Along with energy, there's also the other utilities optimization, so to speak. Uh, water, something as mundane as garbage collection. Um, you know, many of these uh, cities have actually been struggling with it. If you just look at the city budgets, and most of the city budgets are actually available online these days. You can actually go and look at, say, all the Bay Area cities, what is the largest spending, right? You will see that most of them are actually struggling in these areas. For example, a lot of these uh, cities have been working around, can we collect 
garbage once in 15 days instead of every five days and things like those. You might think like they're totally inconsequential, but you know, they really impact the whole, whether the city can actually pay its police force and have its fire guys on board or let them go. It's pretty much like boils down to those kind of answers. So I think that a lot of uh, data around those, which may not necessarily be the typical quintessential smart city, but just simply having data and analytics around those is going to be a huge deal. Uh, the other segment that has gained some interesting traction in cities like New York and Portland and some others is just people participation in the city. So, for example, you know, most of the cities, uh, especially the largest cities, I'm sure San Francisco has one, I'm not sure, but they have a lot of helplines that just help people uh, with day-to-day -day things, uh, essentially. They're like the 311 numbers, right, that you can call up for city support lines. Many of these cities spent millions of dollars just staffing people, <coughs> providing support, providing answers around 311. Uh, some cities have taken proactive measure of just providing an online interface to begin with. Some other cities have come up with things like mobile apps where you can take pictures of potholes or broken signs and actually just send them to the cities and they then follow up on those. Simple measures like that have saved lots of money to the cities. Um, there's a classic case, not to kind of drag on this, but that I read was, uh, apparently some district in Portland, there was a part of the business district in Portland uh, that was suffering a lot because essentially what would happen is that there would be a ton of traffic jam around that in specific times of the day. And so nobody would want to go there and that's where most of the commercial areas also were. By commercial I mean retail and you know boutique stores and stuff like that. So they were really seeing a decline in the whole retail segment. Nothing to do with the product or the economy but just that there was too much traffic and nobody wanted to be seen around there. Right? And also this comes in back with our friend's problem of parking because people won't find parking and it's just a pain and they wouldn't want to be there. And uh, so a lot of people sent that feedback and what the city did was they ran a lot of polls from what I remember, just asking people who lived in that segment. And the way I think you could get back is again through your mobile phones when you were there in that street. That's the only way a poll was counted or something. So they actually wanted to hear from people not just doing some armchair thinking but actually on the street there and facing some trouble. And finally, they came up with the conclusion that the best way to solve this problem is just block that road off. And um, they converted that whole patch into just a bike lane or something like that. That's the call they took. So you had to park like a few blocks away and only if you were walking at a bike lane. And after that, that whole district saw like a humongous increase in the whole retail story. So I'm just saying they would have probably never learned that if they were going the orthodox way. So, so there are opportunities like that to learn. Yeah. I have a two-part question. First question is for all the panel members. What are the three use cases or products you see both in the consumer as well as the enterprise space in the next 24 to 36 months? The second question is for GE and uh, Cisco members. If you look at the big data evolution and explosion happened since Yahoo and uh, Google published the white, the basically their R&D projects as a white paper, if there is any new technologies which is evolving there, is GE and Cisco going to publish that white paper well in advance so that a lot of startups can uh, evolve around that? Yeah, the three use cases or products on the consumer and enterprise space for the next 24 and 36 months. So I'll, I'll you go with the first uh, B2B, the enterprise space, right? <laughs> and then, and the cons you know, Cisco uh, consumer, you probably saw, seen our flip, departure from flip and uh, links us. Uh, but uh, I will try to take a shot. That won't be a Cisco viewpoint in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> that will be my personal viewpoint. But in terms of enterprise, honestly, um, we are following the money, right? It's following the money where we are making the biggest impact. Um, oil well, rig in a box, mm -hmm. right? It's not easy. If you look at oil oil extraction, there are about, you know, throwing numbers, let me tell you a number, 10 terabytes of data is collected as you're drilling the oil mm -hmm. sensors. And typically they are located in, in some parts where some people are not welcomed or it is very difficult for you to have a lot of people over there. So you're collecting all this information and you need to be, today, you know, your backhole often is a satellite link, a very narrow band satellite link. So you cannot send all those terabytes of, of data back to analyze and understand which way to move your sensors. So they are, they are physical tapes that are sent by helicopters and your, your oil well is, uh, is stationary for three weeks. 
and then it get analyzed in Amsterdam or in Houston, and then it's sent back, and then they have the next way of doing things. The, uh, so what, what they need is something that runs analytics at the location and makes a lot of the decisions, filters out, throws 98% of the data which are not relevant. Mm. That's the reality in oil well. 98% of the data are not relevant. That's that, that specific information that you need. So you need to do quick analytics and be able to make those decisions and the narrowband satellite link should be enough to get you going. Why am I saying that is big? Because you know that Oil, oil companies make a lot of money, <laughs> and 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 they are measured by the their oil reserves. Now, if they have, if they can reduce three weeks of downtime every time oh, the tape runs out, that makes a huge impact. So they are willing to do, uh, you know, a lot of things with us at big dollars. So that's one area. The the second one would be uh, from from our perspective is the is the uh, industrial plants manufacturing plants. If you look at the manufacturing plants, you have equipment from Siemens, you have from GE, you have from Rockwell, and all those, they have all their legacy protocols, because that's how those industries came from. And they talk among themselves, but they don't talk to each other. So you need a, a, an, an something that will equalize so that you have the total view of the plant, what is happening on the GE islands, Siemens Islands and Rockwell Islands, and they can talk to each other. And coming over to an Ethernet IP-based network from Profinet, or from uh, or in the oil SCADA or Profibus, and so on, uh, to an Ethernet IP or in the vehicle CAN bus. So that that itself is for us uh, looks like the world of frame relay, ISDN, ATM to IP. We see a similar thing that will happen in the industrial automation, where we call this operational technology coming to Ethernet IP. That's a big uh, task. One of the key differentiators is the deterministic Ethernet, which my colleague from GE talked about, because we knew those protocol existed for a reason. And as we move to Ethernet IP, we have to assure that the, that the uh, reliability of those Ethernet is matching what, what those protocols are. So there is a huge investment. And someone talks, uh, talked about Stuxnet. Those are very important. As you now make those plant, which were supposed to be isolated, as you make them connected to the world, the level of security that is needed and, and the connectivity over there is a huge, huge area. And this goes for both deterministic wired network and deterministic wireless, which is even tougher. Huge opportunity on deterministic wireless, whether it's mining, oil and gas, or manufacturing plant. So those are some of the area. And the third one would be in the transportation, whether it's along the uh, roadside equipments. These are along connected rail, connected road, collecting all those information. These infrastructures are put will be put out there for 15, 20 years. So the, the revenue generation from our point of view, both for the infrastructure as well as for the end-to-end -end system, is huge. That Those are the B, B2B angle. And uh, B2C, uh, I don't know, I don't know three, but the one that we are, or one or two that we are looking at is around uh, home uh, automation. And we have something with AT&T, Connected Life, uh, and, and we want to see how we can replicate that. This is around aggregating all your Zigbee, Bluetooth, all those things into one hub at home, and then providing you that control. And uh, health and wellness uh, in the healthcare. So um, I'll, I'll pass it on. Okay. Sure. So um, thank you. So let me actually take the second part of the question. I'll skip the first part. Uh, I really don't have any comments on that. Um, and I'll probably uh, want you know the other panelists also to jump in on the second part. So sure. if I understood the question correctly, you are talking about the evolution that's happening in the big data space and you know uh, what are we doing and as and when we are ready with something which is breakthrough, would we be sharing with the world in some sense? Um, so I would make it just a larger. Uh, you know, sort of question here. So, in the big data space, uh, there is a ton of excitement today. Um, you know, our host, Aerospike, has got a story, and you know, like I mentioned, a few companies and ourselves. There is a lot of story essentially right here in the Bay Area that's emerging in the big data space. Now, what is happening is that uh, if you uh, just kind of loop back, uh, you have to understand that th a lot of the excitement in the big data space uh, happened really in the distributed computing world. So, I'm really putting on my tech hat for a few minutes and just bringing in all the you know NoSQL and big data experience that I have. And I'm just trying to speak from that standpoint that 
a lot of this happened in the distributed computing space. So when you saw all those papers emerge from Google, uh, they were really trying to tell a story of how they solved uh, a at scale problem from a distributed computing standpoint. So I'm talking about all those papers, you know, the, about let's say the, you know, the Chubby or Big Table or GFS and all those things which kind of spurred this whole big data excitement, right? And then everyone knows now they have become legendary those stories. But you know when, uh, you know, essentially uh, what has become uh, now Lucene and stuff like that. But when Notch was trying to solve the same problem, uh, and then there were other companies also. Even Cosmics was trying to build its own. Um, you know, sort of big data platform. They all took inspiration from Google and kind of uh, reinvented the wheel in some sense. But obviously, there was no publicly available wheel, so they reinvented a publicly available free open source wheel out there, uh, and it was all great. And a lot of that happened from I think from 2006 to about 2009, 2010. Um, in 2009, 2010, actually was uh, to my mind uh, one of the biggest uh, sort of turning points in this whole. Uh, scalable large data space, let's put it that way, right? So we started seeing a ton of different NoSQL companies emerge. And NoSQL is actually a very weird and, uh, you know, um, misused term, but uh, because NoSQL essentially means anything that was not SQL, it's technically it was not SQL, but not relational if you think about it, right? Uh, but a lot of different platforms emerged. And uh, now if you look at it, I think uh, there's a lot of evolution that has gone from just managing high throughput and large volumes to going back to what the database guys have done over the years. So if you think about it, all the database guys have spent the last 20 years, 25 years, innovating around query processing, around optimizers, around uh, columnar formats, around uh, uh, you know OLAP versus OLTP. That's where all the work has happened, right? And there are a ton of great products in that whole space, right? From standard, good old relational databases to you know, a lot of the data warehousing type of solutions, so on and so forth. And a lot of that has come into the big data world. So if you look at it, for example, today, a lot of the innovation that's happening in terms of how do we query faster? Can we do something better than MapReduce? Let's say, which is the classic thing that has been a quest for a few companies. And you see innovation from, say, something like Hawk that Pivotal was trying to build, or Impala that, you know, friends at Cloudera are building. Uh, they're basically trying to go back to basically writing a, a, a query engine, if you think of it. If you, if you get down to the crux of it, what are they actually inventing? They are writing a query engine. They are writing a statistics-based optimizer, right? All of these things that the database guys have been writing for the last 20 years, and many of you guys have been in this field, so you can probably kind of speak to that. Um, and so a lot of that optimization is happening. Uh, the other thing that is happening is this whole element of real time. Now, real time itself is a pretty tricky term. Um, you know, in my sort of past life, so to speak, I spent a lot of uh, time uh, building very real-time applications for the financial service world, you know, uh, and that time real-time really meant uh, not even like milliseconds. Milliseconds was too much because you could lose too much money, not for any other reason. And uh, so there was a lot of optimization at that point in time, just simply around getting data faster. Uh, and you know, all those event stream ESP type of technology emerged in that world, right? A lot of event stream processing. Some of that is being brought back into the distributed world. Because when we were talking about ESP, sure, we were talking about speed, but we were not talking about volume of data and speed. We were talking about small volumes of data, but just focusing on speed, on optimizing bandwidth, on optimizing, you know, basically inverting the querying process, you know, put a filter, run data through it, that kind of story, right? Now, when you take the big data space, you can't technically do that. It's too hard, especially if you're trying to run that through multiple gigabytes, terabytes, and forget petabytes. Petabytes is too much. It's easy to speak about petabytes, you know, it's very hard to deal with petabytes. Let me just say that. I don't know how many of you dealt with petabytes of data. Mm -hmm. I mean that. Yeah. So it takes it takes a while just to copy petabytes, right? Just to even copy a petabyte of data from drive to drive it takes a long time, right? Just so I'm just saying like it's easier to say about that. But I'm saying managing throughputs at multiple terabytes or petabytes is a totally different beast. Just even trying to manage that much data, just just move that much data, just copy that much data, is a humongous problem. And I think that problem was solved with this whole Hadoop evolution, so to speak. At least it was solved to an extent where it became bearable, right? With this whole distributed HDFS file system, it said, okay, you know what? Don't worry about the size. Throw it in and let horizontal scaling just solve that problem. So anyway, long story short, don't want to keep rambling on this, but I think there is a ton of innovation happening. A lot of exciting stuff around querying, optimization, real time, lots of things that are going to happen in the big data space. A lot of that is happening from you know various small to large companies in the Bay Area. Uh, we have our own story. We are trying to play in that own story along with extending products, adding things, building things of our own. 
uh, for example, we have a huge interest in time series data because ultimately if you think of all the sensor data, everything is time series data if you think about it, right? There's a time point, there's some value, and then there is some sort of attack. Sorry, yeah. I'll <laughs> so anyway, so you, yeah, you'll see a lot of innovation there. And I, I just want to add, add one, yeah. one, okay. one quick thing on okay. that one. There's a network approach to the data oh, as well. And uh, as, a, as a in Cisco, we're looking, okay, the, the uh, you know, GE talked about real time. You cannot assume that you do something and something gets computed in the cloud and comes back in the real time, honestly. So when you put those challenges, scalability, bandwidth requirement, real time, then you would come to a different type of network architecture. Even analytics, you will come to a different architecture. So we come, we have concluded that we needed a hierarchical architecture for analytics. So analytics at the edge, close to the device is different from analytics in the cloud, but also means that the networking role has to change. If we have to make our service provider, if we have to make our customer uh, profitable, we cannot have all the data pass through. Mm -hmm. So what we are, we, what we have uh, started a concept of, and we are productizing, is called fog computing. You know, you have the cloud up there, and the fog is more close to. So, so <laughs> this is this. By the way, FOG doesn't have any meaning, but it's really the fog. <laughs> if you are if you are in a Golden Gate Bridge and you know the fog comes, so <laughs> fog computing is a mini cloud computing in terms of compute, network, and storage and a middleware that does the red, uh, resource management across the peers. So if a edge device is running out of capacity, it can, outs it can, uh, it can point to the peering uh, fog device for it to do. So we will see those kind of architecture come to solve this petabyte and zettabytes of data because otherwise the backhaul and the latency and the real time, all those things cannot be solved. So, yeah, I just want Sukant and Brian to, to answer briefly. It's 9 o'clock already, obviously, of a very fascinating topic, and we will have to stop after that, so uh, yeah, please so go ahead. Okay. So, uh, one thing that we face right now, uh, opportunity-wise, beyond parking and beyond some of the validation concepts and stuff like that, is essentially the real-time aspect of data. A lot of information is out there. You can collect real-time, and you can localize it as if you want to go build something of your own, there is a lot of infrastructure out there that gives you the data that you're not gonna get from the traditional enterprise that you can get now, and you can get that filtered. So if you're looking at opportunities like, look at that, because we do get that you know, thing, and being a small startup, we can do all it in all of this. So I, s I meet people, you know, lots of people ask about what they could do around the, around the fringe. That's where money is happening, real money, it may be small, but it can be repeated. And if you go build these things focused on local areas, you can build a successful business and, and you know, kind of replicate it in multiple successful areas. Um, so uh, is anyone out there using Storm, Apache Storm yet? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, so uh, we're going to be hosting the uh, Storm uh, users group here uh, in this building. I think it's, what's the 26th, Monica? 24th, thank you. Uh, so Ted Dunning of MapR, um, also an NEA company like us, is going to be talking about real-time processing. Uh, I'm very excited about Storm. Uh, we're looking at it very strongly here as a real-time database company because it, it, it forms a great interconnect pattern. Uh, we're, we're hearing a lot of our customers using Storm and the Storm processing system. Uh, you need a level of reliability if you're doing Trident, for example, for, um, for actually keeping track of uh, message reliability. So uh, we're going to be uh, thinking and working a lot with the Storm community in that. So uh, consider coming out. Uh, to hear uh, to Ted Dunning uh, talk about what MapR is doing and some of the real-time use cases that they have. What? 24th? 24th. And so it's on meetup.com. Thank you very much to our panelists for a fascinating <laughs> discussion. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here and keeping the discussion lively. And uh, we are all excited about a glimpse into the future. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thank